Salve, my name is Geza Frank. I'm a musician, reenactor, and officer in the militia segment of the Austrian army. Welcome to my 14-day experiment, where I'm going to wear the armor of a Roman repentant soldier of the 4th century AD for 10 to 12 hours a day while eating Roman combat rations. All this is going to culminate in me scaling a 2,300 meter high mountain in full Roman combat gear. Here is day six. Okay, here we go. Um, I thought of something special today uh, to keep me entertained. Um, because I have a very weird sleeping pattern at the moment, I am just going to use the night time uh, for some activities. And um, I'll just put on the armor now, and then I'll go out scouting a bit to the forest. You will say, well, why do you need the armor to go out scouting? Is it not better to just not have the armor on and be light and nimble, swift and uh, make not much noise? Yes, it is, of course it is. And um, I'm putting on the armor just because that's the name of the game at the moment. I'm wearing armor all day. Um, maybe not the best choice, but uh, still I want to try it. Uh, it's minus degrees outside and it snowed and um, I'm gonna wear these. So first I put on the Udones, the socks. Then come the gaiters, the leg wraps. Make sure that they sit well and just at the knee and that the cords that keep them up are not too tight so that they don't restrict your blood flow when you are crouching down. Usually these hold pretty well by themselves and don't need a knot. Same thing, you don't want to just close it down here. To make sure that it's all nicely and tightly packed. And again, not too tight with the cord here because it doesn't stretch. And you're gonna have a problem with blood circulation. So yeah, I actually prefer those uh, leg wraps to those other leg bands, you know, those long bands that you have to crisscross over. Um, I actually don't use them that much anymore. Um, first of all, we see them quite rarely in a military context in the art of the 4th century. What we see mostly are those kind of wraps that, that are held together with two cords. And um, I can totally see why, because uh, you're much more flexible. Uh, it, you're much faster, they're much less annoying, they're much easier to clean. I mean, imagine cleaning a, a band of like several meters long and scrubbing it away there. Here you just have this one um, piece of cloth and, and you're fine. And um, yeah, they're just easily stored away and they're very quick to put on and they don't fall off when you run about. Um, I participated in a great event in Brittany in uh, October 2020. Uh, it's the hunt for the mythical boar, Turtwith, or however you pronounce it over there. And um, it was great fun. And we ran about the forest uh, like real hunting parties. And I saw many of those leg bands un be undone, uncoming, and people falling over. And uh, that happened also to me. So since then, basically, I use only these leg wraps here. Also, what's um, important is uh, we have really good archaeological sources for these leg wraps. From Sograd Mose in Denmark, we have uh, two legs, just the legs. Uh, they're preserved pretty well and they're still wearing those leg wraps. Um, apparently, though this I need to check again, the original color of those leg wraps was blue, uh, which is very intriguing because 
Most of the leg wraps that are supported by Roman soldiers in art are blue or kind of black, but like probably they mean some sort of blue, shades of blue. And so maybe, maybe these legs belonged at some point to somebody who has served in the Roman army even. It's not very uncommon. Lots of people in the late Iron Age of Scandinavia have actually been uh, serving in the Roman army. So we find lots of coins from the Roman Empire up there. We find lots of objects and pretty much most of the swords that we today use in late antiquity reenactment um, are actually models from up there, though we're pretty sure that they were made in the Roman Empire and that they served in the Roman army, um, they, 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 they're there and we find them in heaps. Uh, we don't find so many swords within the Roman Empire because uh, there's a different grave culture. The Romans often didn't bury their dead with grave goods and especially not with, with swords. So it's rare that we find swords here, especially not in grave contexts. But up there, in Scandinavia, it's a bit different. We find also lots of stuff in bogs. Here, outside in the wild, already two hours in the middle of the night, what you can see at the back here, it's not the sun rising or dawning, that's uh, Vindobona, that's Vienna glowing into the night sky. I'm about 20 kilometers away from Vienna here in the Mons Getium, the Viennese forest. And it's got about minus six degrees at the moment here. Uh, it's quite a bit of wind going, as you may be able to hear, but I'm feeling totally fine. Um, my cloak is quite thick wool. It's made and hand woven in Siberia by uh, the Starikov twins. It's very um, thick weave, which is ideal for winter. This cloak has a typical ovoid shape of a clamis or a paludamentum. And uh, this was basically in iconography. We see that this type of cloak is predominantly the type of cloak worn by soldiers. We actually don't really recognize the rectangular shapes for sure, um, which would have been the typical cloak of soldiers in earlier centuries, but we see mostly what looks like ovoid cloaks. Now, those cloaks are pinned together by a crossbow fibula on the right shoulder, uh, which always leaves your right shoulder and your right arm exposed. Uh, which isn't ideal, uh, I find, for situations such as the one I'm, right, I'm, I'm in right now. Because your right shoulder is always a bit colder than your left and that's uh, not great. I mean, you can obviously change the position of the cloak and have both shoulders covered and all is fine. But there is nothing that indicates that this was common. 
it seems that those cloaks were pretty ceremonial, were pretty important in the decorum and the fashion of the time. And it seems that uh, messing about with them wasn't something that was uh, well seen. The famous scene of uh, Martin of Tours, St. Martin, um, ripping his cloak basically in two to share the inner side with um, a beggar. That was a bit of a scandal back then. So, um, yeah, uh, a St. Martin's cloak, also my cloak, has two layers because it is in its ground form oval but it is folded in half so that it makes a semi oval and then it's pinned at the right shoulder that means you have an inner uh, layer and an outer layer um, this holds extremely warm I've used this cloak already in uh, sleeping in the forest outside when it rained all night and I just span this cloak like a roof over myself with a few ropes and stayed dry all night was perfectly fine. I mean, yes, the wool gets wet after a while, gets soaked after a while. Another advantage of these um, folds, so inner and outer fold basically, is that if the outer fold gets wet, the inner one, the inner side facing you, is still dry. Uh, yes. Unfortunately, you can't see much, probably can't hear much with the wind. But I intend to stay here for a couple more hours walking around in the snow. Um, I have to keep moving because if I stay and stand too long in one place, my body is fine, ears, face and hands when I hide them under the cloak are fine. But my toes, they're buried in snow. They're getting too cold, so I need to keep moving around. It's a very nice forest around here. Very beautiful, very big and old trees. It's a historic landscape. I'm basically here right on the road that connects uh, two camps. Today it's the city of Klosterneuburg, which um, the Roman camp name we don't know anymore for sure. And the next camp is about um, 15 kilometers from here and it is called Kanabiaka in ancient sources. Today it's called Zeiselmauer. And it hosted potentially some cavalry. And it was certainly um, used far until the end of the fifth century, despite Hunnic activity and Attila's kingdom expanding here as well. There was a population living inside of the camp and uh, of, inside of the camp. Well, there was population civilian population living inside of the castell, of the castle. I hope um, that the light out there will be sufficient so that we see what I'm actually doing out there on the phone. So I just came back from outside from a little reconnaissance and vanguard mission. Uh, it was nice. I saw the sunrise. Fortunately, most of the stuff uh, that I filmed during the night, you can't see anything. There's like, the moon didn't really shine through the clouds. So, uh, yeah, post maybe one, one thing for good laugh. So I am going to catch a little bit of sleep. It's about 8, 8.30 now, I think. Um, before I get up again and go on uh, with wearing the armor and do some sports, I'm going to be pretty exhausted. I have also eaten very little and drank very little in the last days. Um, my intention is basically to simulate a few days of high intensity, not, not camp life, but campaign life. You have to imagine all the communication lines that can uh, lead to an attack. It has to be secured from surprise so that's uh, something that some troops do they secure the perimeter and um, so basically I was simulating a little bit of that when I do that in the modern army uh, it's also very tiring and you eat and drink not a lot you're basically out there the whole night you're not getting a lot of sleep 
and so that's why I'm going to just catch a few an hour or two of sleep and I'm, as you can see I'm going to keep the armor on something that I do also in uh, maneuvers in the modern army the contemporary army um, because it's not worth to take it off and put it back on when there can be an alarm anytime when you're basically never sure if you're gonna get much rest at all if you have to maybe get up in a few minutes so I'm just gonna sleep here crash out a little bit in armor Hear the wind going through the branches. I think I can hear some small forest rivers also in the distance. It might just be the wind blowing through the hills. And Tops. It's very calm anyway when you're out here, when you're thinking this is such a historic landscape. It's only about 1,700 years ago that maybe some soldiers dressed pretty much like me, hopefully like me, because that would mean that I did my job well, um, roamed about these hills thinking about summer but also winter winter's night like now has its charms I can definitely recommend anybody that's not familiar with reenactment living history etc it is uh, a really unique experience I've, I've not known people that had those moments in historic clothes in historic places in such nights where you can just feel the adventure where you just feel a bit more exposed to nature and to history and to the sort of state of, of, of human existence for millennia before our modern world brought so many comforts and numbing I would say to our senses with all the advantages that it brings ultimately that's a nice topic because um, yes, our modern world brings certain things that are very new to our species. Ver certain comforts and certain systems and mechanisms that are just very numbing. There's, there's a lack of, of sensuality in many things. There's an overload of information. Uh, and it's quite sterile information replacing pure, raw sensitivity. 
and a sense of danger. And many people like me in living history, in reenactment, they seek out this sort of small dangers, small discomfort, small obstacles by mimicking historic ways of life, small obstacles you can overcome, just some sort of a an experience, I guess. Maybe we are romanticizing the past to a certain degree, because yes, our modern world has many comforts and living history or reenactment such as I do it now is one of those comforts. I can just go about go around here, pretend to be a glorious Roman border guard soldier and not actually fear for my life the next day because I might get clubbed to death by some bandits or whatever it is or uh, succumb to malnutrition or some other disease without any help or some natural disaster. I can do all this seeking of a bit of danger and relative safety. And this is one of the great advantages of today's time. We can remedy some of the numbness of the modern world by enjoying such luxuries as um, escaping into another world.